answers that we have, answers that we have. Uh, before I start, I would just say that what image you do, uh, what, what imaging you do uh, is more uh, governed by what you're expecting to find out than, uh, you know, a, a knee-jerk reflex of getting a CT or MRI, what is available. Often a CT is done, is done when an MRI is indicated or an MRI is done just because you think it is better when a CT is indicated. So you just need to be aware what you're looking for, what is the best modality to pick it up and then order the investigation and always write what you're expecting or where you expect the lesion to be for the uh, radiologist because it's just not, you know, a whole body scan picking up anything abnormal. It's ideal if the patient can magnify the areas where you're looking for so that subtle imaging, subtle lesions can be picked up. So CT scans, major clinical indications would be orbital disorders uh, where you have acute intracranial bleeds and bony anomalies what you're looking for. The advantage is that it's very fast, it's uh, rather inexpensive now and in conditions where MR is contraindicated like a patient having a metal implant in the body anywhere. The disadvantages are the radiation exposure, the contrast allergies that, that, uh, that occur and bony artifacts that are occurring particularly in regions where uh, there is a, a lot of bone around like in the brainstem and all where it's difficult to pick up uh, soft tissue lesions on CT. So you can see that uh, uh, it's point of this. You can see that a CT is better in subarachnoid hemorrhages and for looking at calcifications. So you have a lesion on the left, you can see a lot of perilesional edema on the MR. But uh, when you do the CT, you can see that uh, there is calcification within this lesion. So you are essentially you're looking for tuberculomas or you're looking for old uh, cysticercosis and uh, this is kind of lesion uh, turned out to be a tuberculoma. Again, calcification within lesions better picked up on a CT. We talked about uh, uh, that patient who had uh, came to us with trauma on the one side and visual loss on the other and this was the image of that patient. You can see trauma was here and uh, the lesion, the fracture goes all along here to the other side optic nerve whereas the ipsilateral optic nerve was spared. So a good CT reconstruction can give us all bony anomalies, bony fractures, uh, Immediately. So when you're looking for uh, a traumatic optic neuropathy, whether it's a direct or an indirect injury, you can do a CT and look at the optic canal and be able to identify whether there is any displaced fracture that needs urgent neurosurgical intervention or it's an indirect trauma causing a visual loss in which you may uh, start IV uh, steroids. We had this case of optic atrophy, a 13 year old male who came to us with gradual progressive loss of vision both eyes uh, for past three years. There was a recurrent history of fracture, uh, multiple fractures which was kind of incidentally picked up which we thought and he had 618 vision in the right eye and 6 by 60 in the left eye. There was uh, a left afferent defect that was there. So uh, a bilateral primary optic atrophy, uh, you are thinking of compressive lesions, you are thinking of uh, toxic although there was no history of any toxic intake and of course hopefully was not taking um, local alcohol and of course you are looking for uh, a, a hereditary optic neuropathy. But whenever you are doing uh, thinking of all along these lines, rule out toxic and get an imaging done. So um, uh, compressive optic neuropathy, a space occupying lesion in the cellar area becomes our most important differential. But the MR showed everything was normal. But again, as has been discussed, never try to think that you know everything. We discussed this MR with our uh, radiologist who is kind of expert in ophthalmic radiology. And the only thing he, he kind of told us was that as near as the optic nerve is approaching the optic canal, and the optic canal, it appears to be thinner. It's kind of looking more thinner as compared to uh, what it normally showed. And there was a little narrowing in the optic canal. So he advised that we should go ahead with a, a CT scan and actually see if there are any changes in the bony canal. And that's what the surprising thing was. We, we saw actual narrowing of the bony canal because of uh, osteopetrosis that was diagnosed and the history of recurrent fractures came in handy that we realized the patient had uh, osteopetrosis. So uh, it's important that the compressive optic neuropathy be identified and you be able to pick up in a directed investigation. So in this case, although we went ahead with MRI, we were not clear what the reason was. So a CT was ordered, which was most specific to pick up. So uh, a CT is useful for bony lesions, for hemorrhages, but particularly acute intracranial bleeds, space occupying lesions if you want to urgently pick up if there's a space occupying lesion, calcification, and even cysticercosis. Uh, we've seen in patients who come to us with acquired motility defects, uh, and we suspect uh, cysticercosis. You can identify just on a CT. You can see the calcification and the uh, space in the uh, around the lesion. 
The MRI is the really the investigation of choice, one would say, for neuro-ophthalmological conditions. And 1.5 and 3T strengths are now available. And 3T, of course, gives us better resolution. And uh, one can pick up more lesions on the 3T as compared to the 1.5T. We've talked about the enhancement. The enhancement is useful for intracranial extensions, for chiasmal and very uh, parachiasmal lesions. Uh, the newer generation scanners can give us thinner sections and a faster scan time. So your, resu uh, your resolution is much better. You have newer applications in the form of fat suppression when you're looking for orbital lesions. You, you have flare techniques when you're looking for demyelination, tumor, and ischemic lesions. You have a diffusion weighted and acute strokes for neurological, and we're trying to work out whether uh, diffusion weighted imaging can help us in acute or uh, uh, ischemic optic neuropathy in helping us pick up acute lesions of the optic nerve and, of course, a functional MRI. The MRI is better if you're looking for brainstem lesions such as infarction, small abscess, or tumor. Brainstem region is very difficult to image properly on a CT because the bone is around that area uh, causing osseous artifacts. Meningeal and dural inflammation and infiltration again is ideal uh, imaged on an MR. Cavernous sinus lesions again are better evaluated on an MR and aneurysms particularly 3T MRA with special attention to the circulars in patients of the third nerve palsy where you're looking for small aneurysms causing the third nerve. A 26-year-old patient presented with sudden unilateral loss of vision, left eye PLPR, uh, right eye 6, uh, 2020, left afferent defect. We, uh, the question is, why do you want to image? So we've discussed optic neuritis. What do we image for? Remember, we're imaging in such, where we're thinking it's optic neuritis. We want to identify whether there is a possibility of the patient developing multiple sclerosis. So you're looking for demyelination. So there, if you have lesions on MRI, the patient is more likely to develop multiple sclerosis and may require a different management or a much better follow-up as compared to those patients who do not have any lesions on the MRI at the time of presentation. So uh, MRI is essentially not needed for diagnosis in optic neuritis, but it's, it's an important investigation to assess the risk of developing multiple sclerosis. The uh, factors that reduce the risk of MS is a normal baseline MRI, male, severe disc swellings, and atypical presentations as we've discussed. Who to do image? Ideally, everybody, but of course it is mandatory and recurrent and those who want to know about long-term prognosis and you should do a T2 weighted imaging with flare and contrast. We have this patient with disc edema, 30 year old female with progressive uh, decrease of vision, hand movements, vision both eyes and you can see that uh, there is uh, atrophic papilledema both eyes. Uh, the patient was referred from neurology as a patient of IIH uh, to please do uh, fenestrations of the optic nerve as a possible mechanism to salvage the vision. Now the question was do we do it? The question always comes in atrophic papilledema, is there anything gained? So essentially we are looking at the uh, we go back a few minutes. We are looking at the sh uh, uh, the cuff of fluid around the optic nerves. In this case, we could see a large cuff of a fluid, and that's what we uh, decided that we can go ahead and drain and possibly get some visual recovery. And the patient did recover fair amount of vision uh, thanks to the ONSF. Uh, another pa patient of disc edema. Uh, 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 the important thing in, this, in these cases is to rule out whether there is a venous sinus thrombosis. So all cases of IIH, you must keep in mind the possibility of IIH in them. Uh, uh, unilateral pale disc edema, non-arthritic uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, if that's your diagnosis. Essentially, no need for imaging. Although, as we said, uh, diffusion-weighted imaging may be a possible modality in the future to pick up acute <laughs> infarctions of the optic nerve. In AI, we are using the ADC maps to try and see, although it's still under investigation and no clear identification is being possible now, as of now. Motility defects, uh, acute onset third nerve, pu always look at the pupil. If there is anisocoria, you would require, if there is, uh, if the pupil is spared and it's partial, you may be seeing a developing third nerve for which an MRI, MRA would be indicated. If it's complete, there are systemic problems, you can just follow up. And if there is no improvement or if there is progression or worsening, you you would plan this and of course if the pupil is involved you are more uh, kind of akin towards suspecting as a possible uh, aneurysms as a cause of third nerve palsy. We had this patient of uh, gaze, last case I'll show a gaze palsy. You can see uh, he had a CT scan done outside which was normal so that's why I'm showing that a CT may not help us always. He had a normal CT with the right gaze palsy. You are looking at the brainstem region which the CT didn't pick up 
and we advised an MRI and we can see a uh, uh, lesion in the brainstem region which was diagnosed as tuberculosis uh, and we treated and the patient recovered his gaze. So the investigation of choice was MR and the CT gave us a kind of wrong information that there's, there's nothing neurological and if you suspect you must localize the lesion and do the appropriate investigation. As I said there are advances which you need to look at. You have the flare imaging for multiple sclerosis, you have diffusion weighted imaging for strokes and MRA which will help you in aneurysms. So I just want to say that you need to localize, you need to know and then try and stop. Thank you. <laughs>